and welcome to The Watchman. Well, if you watch this show on a regular basis, you know that Israel and the Jewish people are facing existential threats from all sides. Whether it's a nuclear Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, ISIS, or the stunning growth of anti-Semitism in Europe, or the open hostility of the Obama administration, things are very rough right now for Israel and the Jewish people. Now, Bible-believing Christians are Israel's greatest friends in the world. But there is even a movement now in the church, especially among some young people, to embrace the Palestinian narrative and say that God is done with the Jewish people. It's called replacement theology, and it is dead wrong. Folks, the Bible makes it very clear that God is anything but finished with his chosen people. In his new book, When a Jew Rules the World, what the Bible really says about Israel in the plan of God, New York Times bestselling author Joel Richardson smashes replacement theology and shows why you should care about what is happening in Israel right now. Joel is one of the most thought-provoking and original voices on Bible prophecy today, and we're very excited to have him on The Watchman today. Joel, welcome. Eric, thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be with you, my friend. Uh, well, look, I think a good place to start is a lot of times people, I think sometimes Christians believe that, that Jesus was a Baptist or a Presbyterian, but as the title of your book, when a Jew, Jew rules the world, spells out, Jesus was a Jew. Imagine that. So, Joel, give us a little background into the Hebraic roots of the Christian faith. Jesus, his disciples, the prophets, and the Jewish roots of this faith that we follow today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually very simple, and, and really all we're trying to do is to return to the actual context of the Bible, yeah. which is to say that God looked down at a world full of pagans, and he chose a man named Abram. And he yeah. turned him into Abraham. He turned Abraham into a family that became known as Israel. And today we call them the Jewish people. And then he, he cultivated that people. And out of that people, he brought forth Yeshua or Jesus, the Messiah, through which his plan was to redeem literally all of creation. And that he would draw in not just Jews, but Gentiles and people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. And so... Today in the church, you have a lot of Christians that say, well, in the New Testament, he, he expanded his original vision. He, he universalized it. And it's true that he threw the doors wide open. Absolutely. But he never did away with his original plan to use the people of Israel and the land of Israel really as the platform from which he would affect this great plan of universal redemption. And so this is what's so essential is coming to understand the very basic foundational principles laid out through the scriptures and, and walking in those because if we don't as Christians, then really we're, we're walking in a, an attitude that Paul the Apostle says is arrogant and we can't afford to walk in arrogance. Yeah, in Romans, Paul makes it pretty clear that God is not done with the Jewish people. Look, Joel, it seems like common sense. If you read the Bible, God says, look, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He says to Israel, um, so where did it all go wrong? Where did this replacement theology begin to set in among Christians regarding the Jewish people? You know, it's amazing how early it started. I mean, you can really begin, and even the end of the first century with Justin Martyr, early second century, some of the early church theologians, yeah. we call them church fathers, yeah. and they began introducing um, very strong anti-Jewish ideas into the the doctrines of the church. After the dispersion of the Jerusalem church, the church began to be dominated by Gentile leaders and bishops. And exactly as Paul warned, he said, don't fall into arrogance. And that's exactly what the church did. And they started articulating this idea that the church is the new and the true Israel. And, uh, you know, today, if you're a Gentile and you come into the faith, then you are grafted into Israel. Yeah. You're, a, you're a wild branch that's been grafted. So it's an Israelocentric uh, plan of salvation. It's not an ecclesiocentric, a church-centered plan yeah. where Jews have to come join the church. It's actually the other way around. Yeah, to the Jew first goes the gospel. Um, what does the new, okay, you talked about the church fathers, obviously, and even Martin Luther, uh, the man behind the Reformation, uh, wrote some pretty viciously anti-Semitic works later in his life, um, sad to say. What does the new Christian anti-Semitism look like today? 
Yeah, and this is exploding uh, across the earth. And, you know, in a lot of ways, we thought we were past this. Uh, you know, the past century, you've had the trending across the globe of Christians rejecting the long, horrific history of the church persecuting yeah. the Jews. And it has been brutal. When you read the stuff, as you mentioned, Martin Luther, it's Absolutely. vicious. I mean, he's calling for the murder of Jews. And we had left that behind, uh, but now there's sort of this reaction where you know, all these young millennials, the 20-somethings, college-age kids, they're in seminary. and they're, Social justice. Yeah, social justice. In the name yeah. of social justice, compassion, and they're buying into this narrative, essentially, that Israel is just this juggernaut, apartheid, runaway, neo-Nazi yeah. state, and they're persecuting the poor, oppressed Palestinians. You know, there's power in narrative. You, you can go back in the Bible, too. You know, little David, and he's up against Goliath. Yeah. And then you have, you know, Jesus, the young revolutionary preacher up against this big religious aristocracy. Yep. And, you know, this narrative gets repeated. They're using that power of narrative to portray the Palestinians as the underdog, yeah. the little guy. Israel, you know, the Israeli defense forces, the strong. And the fact of the matter is, yes, there are Palestinians that are suffering. Sure. But why are they suffering? They are suffering primarily because of the unrepentant attitude of their leaders who refuse to reject the Islamic concepts and prophecies and idea that it is their divine destiny to exterminate the Jewish people. Everyone tries to blame it on the state of Israel. But when you look at the history of Islam, you have open calls for the genocide of the Jewish people. You have Muhammad's example of wiping out several Jewish villages. And there was no state of Israel. So anti-Semitism and Jewish hatred is foundational. It's systemic. It's endemic in Islam. And there will be no peace for the Palestinian child until repentance of this genocidal hatred uh, spreads throughout the Palestinian community. Yeah, I think that's a great word to use. It isn't used enough when it comes to this issue, repentance. Uh, and as you said, Joel, it doesn't look like the Palestinians or, or the jihadists, the Islamic world in general, is ready to repent. Um, do you see this Islamic anti-Semitism? We obviously have the rise of ISIS now, which is a demonic genocidal organization. Uh, do you see this coming to sort of a big conclusion? I mean, is there, it, when, is, when is God going to say enough with the world of radical Islam? Personally, I believe the enough is actually at his return. Yeah. I think there'll be a series of events and wars and regional conflicts where it may even appear as though ISIS takes a massive hit. Um, I'm actually thinking there's some solid biblical and then just geopolitical evidence that Iran is about to break out in a massive regional war, a full-blown military invasion of ISIS. I think ISIS may be the bait that lures Iran out. Could be wrong, but even if ISIS is They're wiped out... They're fighting right now, for sure. Yeah, I mean, really, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a side note, what's yeah. unfolding right now in, in many, many ways, it's not just this, but it really is a proxy war that's being fought between Turkey and Iran. Mm. And this is the same pattern throughout history. You know, you had Medo-Persia and Greece or Yavan. Mm -hmm. And then you had the Roman Empire versus the Parthians. Oh, yeah. And then you had the Byzantines and the Sassanids. Uh -huh. And then the Ottomans and the Safavids. Yep. These parts of the world are repeatedly clashing. And even in the, in the spiritual realm, it's the prince of Greece and the prince of Persia. Mm -hmm. There's just sort of this ancient spiritual conflict. Turkey, as you well know, is using ISIS in its proxy war against Iran, against the Kurds, and against Assad. Yes. They're giving logistical military support. Uh, ISIS fighters are going back into oh, Turkey yeah. for... And they're not, the whole, uh, Turkey is not being held accountable for this either. No, no. Uh, and they're, they're letting tens of thousands of them flow in, and then they oh, arrest yeah. two or three, and they say... And the oh, illicit oil trade as well. Turkey is letting that go on, and ISIS is making millions off of that. Yep, yep. And so, you know, of course, that's Turkey's proxy. That's Turkey's junkyard dog, mm -hmm. ISIS. But then, of course, Iran has its proxies in Hezbollah and Lebanon. Sure. Now the Houthi rebels down on the southern border mm -hmm. of Saudi and Assad. And, you know, so they, they have their proxies. And so that there's already a war going on, but it hasn't escalated to a full-blown conflict. Mm -hmm. I think there's solid evidence that Iran may basically mop the floor with ISIS in terms of Iraq and Syria. Mm -hmm. But even if that's the case, they already have a stronghold in Libya, in the Sinai. And so yeah. there's going to be some major 
wars in the Middle East before the return of Jesus. Yeah. But in terms of when does God say it's enough, I believe it's when Jesus returns. And the reason that I say this is because I think it's important that the church recognizes that Islam is not going away. And it really is the greatest global challenge that we as the body of Christ are going to face before his return. And what that means is we need to get off our duffs and get about the business of proclaiming the gospel, returning to an early church theology of the cross and martyrdom, and going for the completion of the Great Commission. Look, Eric, if ISIS can recruit 30,000 young people from all over the world to join their organization, then can we get 5,000 people to lay down their lives as missionaries? Amen. Uh, Joel, we got to leave it right there. Come back more after the break right. with Joel Richardson. We're going to talk much more about this book, When a Jew Rules the World. Don't move. Much more to come. And welcome back. We're talking to Joel Richardson, author of a great new book, When a Jew Rules the World. Uh, Joel, in your book, I mean, you delve deeply into this issue on so many levels, but we talked about replacement theology before the break. Uh, tell us about restorationism and why that's important. Sure. I, I use the term restorationism <clears throat> to articulate the opposite of replacement theology, which in sum is very simple. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says, listen, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now, when you read the replacement theolo theologians, they all say, well, the disciples were idiots. You know, they had no idea what they were talking right. about. And, but Jesus doesn't rebuke them. And in fact, later, Peter says, as he's proclaiming, as he's proclaiming the gospel, he says, listen, at the restoration of all things. He's talking about the same thing. There is no restoration of all things without the restoration of Israel. And this is what's so essential, is that when Jesus yeah. comes back, he will restore the throne of David. It says that he will sit on his throne of glory. He will actually, the, the throne of David is the Jewish monarchy. It's their Jewish royal dynasty. Jesus is coming back to restore that kingdom over which he will rule the whole earth. And so this is a component that so much of the church, they believe Jesus is going to come back and rule. Well, where is he going to rule from? Yeah. He's going to rule from Jerusalem, right. from Israel, from the restored kingdom of Israel. And he says, and, and when he comes back, he says to his disciples, you will sit to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. You can't get any more Jewish yeah, than that. No. There's very, there's, the Bible's filled with very distinctly Jewish characteristics yeah. of the kingdom that will be established possibly in our very near future. Yeah. It's amazing how it's just kind of all developing. And you mentioned earlier how there has been the last century a movement, although we have replacement theology, we have a movement among Christians who do get this. And thank God that you're writing books like this, Joel, that are waking people up and educating people. Tell us also another theme in the book or a topic you address in the book, the time of Jacob's trouble. Why is that significant? This is huge. Uh, when you look at the words of Jeremiah, and then again in Daniel and Jesus in his Olivet Discourse, they warn of the time of Jacob's distress, Israel's trouble, Israel's distress. In fact, the very term, the Great Tribulation, in context is Jesus talking about Jacob's trouble. And it talks about the nations gathered together against Jerusalem to essentially make an effort to, to uh, effect that final genocide yeah. of the Jewish people. Now listen, we as the church look back, we judge the German church for failing during World War II. Yet the scriptures have clear evidence that something far worse is actually coming. We have all of the evidence, hatred throughout the earth, and by and large, we're doing nothing about it. It's sure. time for the church to wake up to this issue. This is a very practical, applicational matter that we need to be aware of. Yeah, we're going to talk about that much more after the break, Joel. I want to get into ISIS with you, the rise of ISIS, what that means and what it means prophetically. And also, you do a lot of great missionary work, obviously. Also, uh, what's going on with the persecuted church right now and some encouragement about how Muslims are coming to Christ in the Middle East. There is encouragement, folks, among all the doom and gloom uh, that we hear about today. So much more coming up after the break with author Joel Richardson. Stick around. And welcome back. We're talking to best-selling author Joel R Richardson. His latest work is When a Jew Rules the World. He's also author of the best-selling books The Islamic Antichrist and Mideast Beast. He's one of the most thought-provoking authors out there uh, on what's going on in the Middle East right now, Bible prophecy. He's also a missionary with a real heart 
for the Muslim people of the Middle East. Uh, Joel, right now, talk about, and Christian people of the Middle East, I might add. So let's talk about Christian persecution right now. What has ISIS meant? To me, it's been just an absolute uh, unmitigated disaster, catastrophe for the church in the Middle East. What has ISIS meant, and what does ISIS mean prophetically? You know, it's amazing, Eric. I, <clears throat> I look at the response of the church to the genocide of Christians in the Middle East, and not just Christians, but Muslims and Yazidis, but, I mean, these are our brothers and sisters that are being slaughtered, massacred, captured in, in sex slavery. In the United States, the church, we treat our dogs better than we're treating our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. In terms of, you know, the, the amount of time and money and everything that we are giving, and there's so much opportunity right now for the church to be the church. And I'm, I'm grateful that there are many folks that are going into northern Iraq. We were there uh, just a few months ago to minister to the refugees. We spent time with Christian refugees, Muslims, Yazidis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to tie this into everything that we're talking about, I was sitting there. We were in northern Iraq, uh, about 15 miles from the Iranian border with a refugee camp of Yazidis, about 16 people. Really, I mean, this was still the winter. Yeah. They're, they're, they're basically camping. It's dropping yeah, it's below 30 there. degrees yeah, at I mean, night. Yeah. They're living in the mud. And I'm looking at them, and I'm saying, 300 years ago, these Yazidis were Jews, and ISIS were Christians all across yeah. Europe that were you know, seizing Jewish property, killing, massacring Jews, driving them from city yep. to city, and they're fleeing from one country to the next, kidnapping their children, yeah. forcing them to be baptized. Yeah. And I mean, that's a, that's a huge comparison. But it's not that far it's off. Not. And so, you know, we are at the place now where the church needs to be the church. We need to be standing up for the Jews that are being hated, mm -hmm. persecuted all across the earth, uh -huh. and standing with our brothers and sisters. The, as crisis increases across the earth, the opportunity to be Christians, to be the church, and to proclaim the gospel, and to minister to those that are in need is going to explode. It's exploding now, and we need to be about the business of being ambassadors of Christ. Yeah, amen. I mean, and there's the old saying in the world of jihad, first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. Jews, obviously, were also chased out of Muslim lands in the 20th century. Thankfully, they made it to their ancestral homeland of Israel or here to the U.S., to Europe. But where do the persecuted Christians of the Middle East go to lay their head? Where do they find safety today? They're not finding it. But I think one of the encouraging aspects of what's going on in the Middle East right now that we don't hear a lot about, Joel, is that there is a move uh, for Jesus in the Middle East and the Muslim world. Tell us about that. Yeah, whenever Satan comes in like a flood, the Lord raises up a, a standard. And, you know, I have friends that are uh, leading the underground church in Iran. And he always jokes, yeah. he says, Ayatollah yeah. Khomeini was one of the greatest evangelists for the gospel yeah. <laughs> because he revealed the true face of Islam. Yeah. And today there's a great revival yeah. sweeping Iran. In the years ahead, we're going to look back, and despite all the atrocities, we're going to say ISIS was one of the greatest evangelists for Christ in history because they are turning people off to Islam. Even Muslims are saying, we're sick of this. Yes. And there are revivals breaking out. You know, our friend Chris Mitchell, uh, Jerusalem sure. correspondent, he's sure. covered some of the revivals in the yes, refugee yes. camps. People are turning yeah. to Christ. Uh, cultural Christians, Muslims, Yazidis are turning to Christ. And partial, yeah. part of that is because the church is going and ministering and, and, uh, and responding yeah. to what Satan's doing. Jesus always has a response. We just need to partner with him in that. Do you think preachers and ministers have pastors have a responsibility right now to speak up about this issue, regardless of denominational differences with the Christians in the Middle East. We, at the end of the day, we're all the body of Christ. Um, do you feel that there is a responsibility among American church leaders to speak out boldly about this? There's no question about it. I mean, there's no question about it. We need to get back to the theology and practices of the early church, yeah. and that's to reclaim the theology of the cross. The cross yeah. is not a vending machine that guarantees we're going to be completely blessed now. Yeah. It's, it's a guarantee we'll be blessed yeah. at the resurrection, but now we are to take up our cross and embrace the cross yeah. and imitate Jesus. And that means laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters and even for our enemies. Yeah, amen. That's why this book is so important, folks, when a Jew, Jew rules the world. Coming up with final thoughts from Joel Richardson, some words of encouragement for you. Stick around. 
And welcome back. We're wrapping up here with author Joel Richardson. His new book, It is a Must Read, When a Jew Rules the World, found Amazon.com, WND.com, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold, pick it up. Uh, Joel, we were talking before the show about how people are kind of waiting for a political messiah to turn all of this around. Tell us why that's not the direction we should be looking in. Yeah, that's excellent. I, I'm about as conservative politically as you can get. And, uh, you know, I'm counting the days down to where, by the grace of God, we can have a better leader in the office, I hope. Yeah. But the fact of the matter remains, whoever gets in there is not going to save us. That's right. We have one Savior. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion, I think a lot of conservatives have come to the conclusion in the past several years, that in the end, the best military, the best political solutions will fail. You know, we, we as the church spend so much time trying to legislate morality and legislate righteousness, which is external. But Jesus' method and model was internal change. Yeah. We have a message about a God who wants to dwell inside of us and transform us from the inside out. And if the church would be about the business of proclaiming that gospel and emphasizing, I'm not saying that politics and military is irrelevant, yeah. but it's not primary for the believer. Mm -hmm. Our primary mandate is to proclaim Jesus, Him crucified, in order that we can become His children. If we will be about that business, we can transform our country and the Middle East, but we need to get about the business of putting first things first. Amen. Joel, thank you so much. We know you're about that business. We're about the business here on this show. The website is joelstrumpet.com. You see it on your screen. Pick up Joel's book, When a Jew Rules the World. Also, Mideast Beast, Islamic Antichrist. Joel, thanks so much. God bless you. Keep it up, man. You're an inspiration. Thank you for joining us here on The Watchman. And until next week, God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. <laughs>